Good morning. As you can see, my apple trees here are in full bloom. Crazy uh, amounts of apple blossoms and we're going to have a really good fruit year. This is my row of interstem trees. So interstem trees have three parts. They have a main root system, a stem that's grafted in the middle, and then the variety of fruit you want is grafted on top of that. The stem in the middle can be used, you know, it can be put there for different reasons, but usually, and in this case, it's for dwarfing the trees. So the interstem in this case is a dwarf interstem, it's bud nine. That is used to choke down the top, top of the tree's growth. It's a weak variety. And then the root system is M111, which is basically a full-size uh, drought resistant root system. A large, vigorous root system that is going to anchor the tree really well so it doesn't fall over, gather a lot of resources, but I keep the tree down. And you can see behind me, I hope, that none of these trees are over about eight foot tall. A little bit of that is from pruning, but mostly it's not. This is just what they do. So these trees will not get a lot bigger than this. I have some trees that I just decided I don't really want, and I'm going to graft those over. So today we're going to graft over a tree, and I'm going to do this video because this is uh, people ask about this a lot and I really want to promote the idea of frameworking. So frameworking means that you keep the structure of the tree instead of like cutting most of the wood off and then grafting it and regrowing all of the structure of the tree, which is what you see when people do like chainsaw grafting where they just kind of cut off these big fat stubs and they put some wood in there and then they regrow basically most of the tree. Well, there's two main problems. One is that you're making these huge cuts, which is really hard on the tree, and you can easily introduce fungus and disease and end up rotting out the center of the tree. The other reason is that it just takes way longer because instead of just replacing the fruiting wood, and we're gonna keep coming back to this idea of replacing the fruiting wood and keeping the structure, we have to regrow the whole structure if you do this kind of chainsaw grafting. I was gonna do a full on well-produced how-to video on this. I thought about doing it this year. Really can't afford to because I'm not making enough money with these videos. Like this is a really important video, I think, and it's an important idea, but people don't watch this stuff you know it's like if i don't either get more money from amazon links which has gone down or patreon which has gone way down i either have to do all that or i have to go do something else for money and i don't have time to do both or i have to switch up my content to be more mass consumable like more something that you know a lot of people will click on and watch for long enough to actually get some ad revenue. It's not what I want to be doing at all, but it's just a matter of uh, survival at this point. I have this cam. I figured, well, I, I have to do this anyway because I'm grafting anyway, so I'm just going to put the cam on. But I think we can make a pretty, sh pretty easy to edit video that will help people a lot with this problem. Okay, here's our tree. This is a Rubinette tree, and this variety just hasn't performed well enough for me that I want to keep it, so I'm going to graft over it because I have this nice structure here, right? I've, I've spent all this time growing this structure. So a typical approach to this, let's just imagine this tree is bigger. Okay, so a lot of, a lot of people, when they regraft a tree like this, they'll go all the way back here, cut this off, put in, you know, two or three maybe scions, and then they have to grow all this structure all over again. So the first year, it's only going to grow like this, no fruit. The second year, you know, it might diversify a little, still no fruit. But let's say with this branch instead, I'm going to replace this. I'm going to replace this. I'm going to replace this. Maybe I'll put one right here. Uh, maybe I'll put one right here. They're going to grow these the first year. And then there's potential for those to start fruiting even the second year. Usually it's going to be more like three years. But if you use long scions, you can actually get the tree back in production pretty fast. The downsides are it takes longer and it takes more scions, especially if you use long scions, which I prefer. I like scions with uh, seven or more buds, like seven to ten buds is good, uh, at least six if I can get away with it. But often people don't have that much wood to work with. But that's okay. You can do it with one bud and it's not going to make a huge difference. You know, you, it might put you back like one year something. So what I want to do is just walk around this tree and I'm going to show you the process of like making decisions about what to do with what to keep and where to put the grafts and all that stuff. This branch broke off and I cut a big notch right here and an adventitious bud, meaning just like a bud that happened to be dormant right here, sprouted out and grew this. It looks like it's three years old and I cut the tip off. This points out a kind of a problem. Now that these 
main scaffold branches, which are like these, you know, side, major side branches that form a structure to grow fruit on. They're really well established and they kind of take a lot of the resources away. And the, before it broke, this was one of those as well. And now this one is going to have a hard time competing with these guys for resources. So that's an interesting problem is how to, how to replace a scaffold like that when the tree doesn't really want to favor its growth. You know, the notching definitely helped and I could see maybe girdling this all the way around but not very wide so it heals up really fast like not enough to kill the top but to kind of set it back and jolt this into getting you know more growth but for now what i'll do is i'm just going to graft something new onto this right here and i'll be using this tree to test out new variety new science that i've i've picked up like chris Amanix came by and visited and gave me a whole bunch of new apple scions that are interesting so one thing i know today is that i'm going to replace all of the fruiting wood on this tree except i may leave just some spurs like this. So this is number one as I'm going to graft onto this and there's no reason for me to not to cut this back. This potentially is worth keeping but I don't need any more than just what I need to graft to right here. In fact I prefer to graft like that. Same with this one. I'm not making decisions about which one of these to keep. You know this is just a little like fruiting spur thing so just in case I'll leave that for now. Not sure about that. If I rep if I use that, it's going to be you know cut back to a stub. Same with this one. Could graft onto that. So I'm just trying to simplify this whole process into getting the stubs cut back, and then I'll decide which ones I'm going to keep. Same with that. I don't really see a reason to keep this lower branch here. It's kind of growing out underneath all of this. These will kind of replace that. So I'm going to actually take this out. That wasn't a very good way to grow that branch in the first place. Okay, so out here, leave something to graft to, leave something to graft to, leave something to graft to, leave something to graft to. This grows kind of down and this grows kind of up, but if I could just twist that like this, which I think I can, that would work better. So I'm going to cut this. You know, with something this size, I'm, I can start looking at, well, you know, maybe I should keep this instead of cutting it back here let this out of the way you don't need both of those and maybe i should keep some of this and treat this more as like structural wood because it's quite a bit you know it's good size wood that let's put one here 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 this is kind of what is the top of this tree it comes up and it has three to four branches going in different directions the third are well spaced so there's one go up seven inches there's another one go up eight inches there was one there that broke go up 10 inches there's one there and then this is the top and we kind of keep that shortened off it's just in this situation this one kind of grew to the side and this kind of grew up a little so normally it would look a little bit more like this and again if i want it to do that i can stake it and i might do that but it's really not important so now i'm looking at which ones of these i want to keep i don't really want that one i think we should just replace all of this why not just keep a couple of these for now let's keep that too i'm going to come back through here and refine this anywhere i might want to use you know i might want a spot to graft I'm just gonna leave that option open. Just in case, we'll do that one. That's a little close in, but just get rid of some of this stuff. There's a definite possibility there. That's a really nice stub to graft onto. This is definitely a possibility there. Definitely a possibility there, here. So we're getting pretty far from the center of the tree. I don't really see keeping any of this. For now, let's leave, let's leave that. This was an experiment testing uh, flower bulbs under this fruit tree as an understory, trying to figure out which ones will perform the way I want them to. Kind of a good spacing for these is around, like if, for instance, I had, you know, one grafted here. This one's pretty far into the center, so I, I'm actually going to not do that, and we already have this one here, so... We're going to do this one here, and then we go up about 12 inches. That's probably like, what, 14 inches there. Graft another one, 
And then like if this were longer and it came out here, I'd graft another one going this way. But in this case, I'll probably just graft onto that. Or I may not even graft that and just graft this. I, I feel like we should just uh, get back in here and replace all of that. And this side thing right here isn't awesome, really. It's, it's real long, it's really close to this, so it's growing straight underneath this branch. I'm gonna go all the way back with that one. So one thing a lot of people would wonder is, isn't this like just too brutal, you know, on the tree? And it's really not if, you know, I wouldn't want to do it when the growth season was really well underway. It's definitely better to do it now. Everything's flowering, but the, the real shoot extension, like the real rapid growth hasn't started yet. And so what's gonna happen is these grafts are gonna heal up really fast, you know, within like a week or, or two. Literally, they could be healed in a week with this weather nice and warm. And then they're gonna just push and grow like crazy. And they're gonna take all the energy that this tree has to offer and do something with it, which is regrowing the top of the tree very quickly. Here's a nice stub right there. This one's a little bit close into the tree and with this one here, I just don't see any reason to keep it. This one is probably worth growing. It's kind of, again, close to the trunk, but I may use that. I probably won't use this. I like this. So there's one and then about 13, 12 inches up here, there's another one. We have, that's still, yeah, let's go with this one. So we have one, two, three, four for sure, I like that one. And I don't see any reason to keep anything else out here, so five. So that's that branch. I'm still on the fence about actually using this one. This is really kind of close. You just have, you have to visualize this growing out and then growing this way. And you look at this, it's 12 inches, right? So if this grows out and this grows out, and each of them only grows six inches this way, well, they're already in conflict. Whereas, you know, this could grow out and then grow out tw 12 inches here and 10 or 12 inches here, and they're just, starting to conflict. I'm not sure, I, I might use this as just a kind of an extra backup or something. Let, let's actually take that off. There's some old, old dead fruiting spurs in here. Once they start to get shaded heavily, they'll usually die. One, two, three options here. I don't really think we need this. So let's do that, bring that back and take that out. Take that one out. Take that off. Take that off. That, nope. Skip that and just graft these two right here. Or I may change my mind when I'm actually grafting and just bring this back, because that's pretty small and it'll, it'll regrow all this really fast. Let's do that. You know, these are real small in diameter, so I, I just feel like we should replace them from this point out. Same with this here. All right, so I hope that gives you an idea. Let's take a look down this branch right here. So it comes out, we have one going this way. This is actually a little close, but I may graft it anyway. Then we have, we go up at the other side of the tree. That's like what, 16 inches, 15 inches this way, come up here, go that way. I'm gonna say we don't need this. Yeah, I think I'll probably end up grafting both of those. I'm just gonna wear this camera on my head and whenever I have something that is, you know, relevant to this and like making decisions about doing this type of grafting, I'll talk about it. But in general, everything else is covered in my grafting series, uh, 10 part grafting series. Okay, so if they're the same size like this, I can put on, you know, a nice whip and tongue graft like that, it's real clean. But most of these I'll be doing cleft grafts. So normally I, I, in an ideal spacing, I'd like to see this one and then one here and then this one and then another one somewhere up here. But this is a good spacing right there. So I'm just gonna leave that. What I'm trying to say is that like, you have this ideal, right? Where these are sort of staggered. So we say this one would come out here and then the next one would be up here and then this one will be here and the next one there. But this is totally fine to have these two come out near each other and then have these two come out near each other. And I still have this kind of like, you know, maybe 18 inch spacing here, which is gonna give, these can each grow toward each other nine inches before they, they really conflict very much. And that's a really good spacing. So don't get caught up on this idea that you, you're gonna actually achieve this perfect ideal model that you might conceive. But if you have a choice, you can kind of do this staggering thing where pretty good.
it really doesn't hardly even matter. The spacing per side that matters more, and even that doesn't necessarily matter. Like if I had one here and there wasn't anything up here for a long ways, I'd just go ahead and graph that because I can always prune off this side of one branch and encourage it to grow more in that direction. I mean, there's things you can do. Don't get caught up on this ideal like super control freak thing because you can't do it anyway. And then this branch I'm grafting limber twigs so someone sent me, I'm sorry, I don't remember who, but thank you. Three different limber twig apples, type of southern apple. I think they're called that because the twigs are, you know, kind of long and weepy and droopy. But I hear really good things about them, especially the Brushy Mountain. Is it Brushy Mountain or Smoky Mountain? I think he sent me Smoky Mountain. So that one's next. All right, with these, I was able to find scions that were the same size as the twigs I grafted onto. One, two, three. This one is not. On this one, I'm gonna cut just the regular, you know, slope cut that we use. And then cut the tongue in like this. It's hard to get a good angle on this. But on this one, I'm gonna cut this real shallow, just like that. So those are close to matching now. They're not perfect, but probably good enough. Then I'll cut a tongue in this. In some ways, this is better than a cleft graft. It's certainly more difficult for beginners to make. It has the advantage of not making a big split in this, which can get water and junk in it, and is a little more likely to become kind of infected and messed up. It does happen. Don't think that the cleft graft is a bad graft or anything like that. It's it's actually a real good graft, and I'll often use it just because it's convenient. Like, I almost used it here, but I'd already started telling you I wasn't going to use it, just because that angle was awkward to work with. So it would have been a lot easier just to split this and stick the scion in there. And that could matter a lot if you're, like, up in the top of a tree somewhere or reaching over your head, because there's no doubt that the whipping tongue is a you know, it takes a little more coordination and finesse. Harder to do in awkward positions. I'm trying to think of the questions people ask. One is, how long does a scion need to be? It could be super short, an inch long with one bud. You know, as long as you have one bud, but that's not a very good way to graft. I mean, you want to have several buds in case something goes wrong. It's good to have, I think, a little bit longer scion personally. I'm sure it has more surface area, but it also has more resources. So the bark on this is about the same thickness as the bark on this big twig, believe it or not. You want to check that and line up the twig accordingly. It's not the bark, it's not the outside of the bark or the wood you want to match up, it's the space between the bark and the wood. That's where all the magic happens. That's where the tree differentiates the cells into wood on one side and bark on the other side. The magic zone, the cambium layer. Okay, now the reason I'm putting two in here, if they both heal, it'll keep this both sides alive. Otherwise, one side of this might just say, oh, I don't need to grow anymore, I'm dying, and it'll die back way back in here and that screws everything up. And if only one takes for some reason or one gets broken, then there's, you know, insurance backup. I would have preferred to leave it full length. It was about like a six inch scion, but instead I cut it because this is a much better way to do a cleft graft. If it's a very small cleft graft, especially if the, the two, you know, are matching in size, then it really doesn't matter. But with a large difference in size like this, it's really better to put in two. No use putting in three. You can't put one in the middle because it won't grow because there's no cambium in the center of this big piece of wood. Remember, it's the cambium, not the wood, not the bark that matters. I forgot to label this. Smoky mountain limber twig. This branch is going to be all russets. I have a whole bunch of russets here. Hoople's Antique Gold, Davenport Russet, Betsy Russet. But we want to, in the top of this one, make a real shallow cut. Like almost just not barely into the wood a little. That was probably too much. Now on this one, the bark on the stalk is definitely a little bit thicker than the bark on this twig. So that means I need to offset it a little bit to make sure that the juicy cambium layer that's gonna do all the growing is lined up on each of them. I think that graft will take. I hope it does. I don't want to lose this variety, but I can't afford to put two graphs of this, all this stuff on every everywhere. Because I have a lot, a lot of cyan wood. I mean just the stuff Chris gave me is a lot, and I have other 
stuff too. And I'll be starting a tree this year that is just my seedlings, of which I have three or four that I want to, you know, use for further testing because they're showing some promise. And as soon as they show any promise, I want to get them out of that trial row, which is a real rough conditions, real crowded, you know, and all that stuff. And I want to get them onto something like a foundation tree where I can uh, further test them out. Okay, so with this one, just in case something happens, I'm going to take the tip off of this and relabel it and just hang on to this for a month or so because I don't want to lose this. Okay, this one is Keener Seedling, and I've been real interested in this one. I talked to Lee Calhoun, the author of Old Southern Apples, on the phone one time. He was uh, gracious enough to put up with some questions from me, and I asked him, did he have any apples that would hang on the tree super late. And he said, Keener Seedling. I was just talking to uh, Mr. Chickadee, YouTube channel Mr. Chickadee, Josh, and he was saying that that's the apple that everyone in his area in Kentucky talks about all the time, is what they call Old Rusty Coat. And apparently Keener Seedling and Old Rusty Coat are the same. He's gonna get me some wood of whatever they have that they call, Keen they call Old Rusty Coat, and I'm gonna graph that. Now, when I ordered Scions from Nick Botner that time. I got an old rusty coat and it turned out to be some big juicy red apple, completely different, um, which I'm gonna graft over this year. So I've been trying to get this apple for a while. I do have another one labeled Keener Seedling that has fruited, but it wasn't particularly, it's not in a very good spot, but it didn't seem particularly impressive. It has enough of a reputation of being a long, High quality, long keeping russet, like um, Josh was saying that they used to eat them while hunting in the winter, like under the snow, and they'd still be good under the snow. So I'm very interested and I'm willing to grow out, you know, several different sources just to make sure I'm getting the best one. And the other thing is that these things, if they're grown for a long time, they can form strains that are different. You know, they're epigenetically differentiated to some degree. Now this one is Golden Harvey, and Golden Harvey, I'm putting a whole tree of this in. So a whole interstem tree of this, because I'm super interested in this apple. Ever since I did my initial research on it, I've just been like, wow, I need that apple. Again, I grafted a whole interstem tree of it. I grew it out, and again, it was a red, totally different, juicy red apple, not even any good at all, like not even remotely good. You know, things get mislabeled. Now this is another situation where I'm gonna go ahead and put in two scions and watch how small the scions I'm gonna put in are. And then this is damaged, so I have to cut it really short. And then I'll trim each of these back to a bud and that's it. And my guess is that both of those will probably grow if I seal it well, which I will. Like I'll paint over the entire, you know, all the scion with uh, grafting paint to make sure it's, you know, it's not gonna evaporate very much before it heals. And, you know, with this weather, callusing happens very fast, like it can happen in a week. If this was the last Golden Harvey Scion in the universe, I might, you know, shade this too, but I probably won't do that. Hoople's Antique Gold. And again, because this is a big split. I'm going to put in two scions and I have a very short and pretty skinny scion here, but I'm still going to do that. Okay, now in this case the bark on this scion is much skinnier. So I'm going to set the the scion into the the cleft a little bit to the side to try to make sure those cambium layers line up a little better, just like that. There's, you know, it's a little dicey putting on scions this small. And, the, and this short, they just, you know, there's not a lot of resources in this, but most likely one of them's going to make it. And I think we're probably increasing the odds by putting two short ones in rather than, you know, it's what which one's going to increase the odds. Plus I get the benefit if both grow, which they probably will, this will be healthier and it'll heal up, you know, probably within a year. That'll be completely closed or at least close to it. And the bigger the cut, the, and if it's a cleft graft, the more you want to do that. Now, I could also do some bark grafts, which maybe I'll do. Here I am making more footage than I probably should be. Okay, this was Hoople's Antique Gold. If I recall right, this is a sport, or which means a mutant, of Golden Delicious. This is uh, called Davenport Russet. I know nothing about it. So when Chris visited, I tried <laughs> to make a video where he was talking about all these apples and what they are, and, and I didn't take any notes because I had video notes, right? That footage 
vaporized. I don't know what happened to it. Either it didn't record or it was lost. Whatever the case, I don't have it. So get back together with him and go over some of this stuff because most of it I never heard before. And there we go, a whole branch of russets. And they're, that's not the only, I told him, I was like, if you got any good russets, I want good russets. Chris is down with the russets like any good apple collector. Most of us are pretty nutty about russets. Jean Gaspar of Lamb Abbey Orchards, which is named after Lamb Abbey Permain, used to jokingly call me Dr. Russet. Cause I was like, you have any russets? What do you got? And there are, there's a whole bunch of good russets that I don't have. And man, talk about something that needs to be bred more of. Now, speaking of John Gaspar, he sent me scion wood last year. Look at this. This stuff's from last year that I never grafted, which is terrible because this stuff is, it looks good. An improved Ashmead's kernel, never heard of that. Brooks, don't know what that is, but if he sent it to me and he was like, you need to grow this, then I need to grow this. And let's just see a whole year in the fridge. It's got like mold growing on it and stuff. If this looks alive, which it looks very alive, I'm gonna graft it. I was digging in there and I was like, what is this moldy bunch of scions here? And when you split these, try to split them as close to the metal as you can. And, and there's a way to steer them if they start to split off to the side. There's a way to steer them, which is to pull harder on the side that's thicker. Like I got this, even though I tried to get it in the middle, it's kind of hard to tell and I got it a little offside. So it started to split that way and I just tried to pry this thicker half. I tried to pry that away more rather than prying this away more. And that kind of kept it at least where it was. It didn't get worse. Now I think the real problem with these very old scions that were in the fridge for a year is that the buds are dead. Like these buds all died. That one might be alive, but it doesn't mean there aren't any buds. There, there's little dormant buds on the sides of these buds that could grow out. My guess is this one isn't going to make it, this ash meads, but this one looks better. It actually has, yeah, this, this still has live buds, even though they're kind of grown out a little bit. Because it's real hot out and some of these scions are very, very small, um, and there's some that are two years old, I'm uh, going to take a minute here to paint these up with grafting wax. And I just coat the whole thing. I used to be careful to like not coat the buds because I thought the buds might not grow through. Uh, not a problem. Eventually I just started slopping the stuff on there nice and thick. And these buds are incredibly strong actually. They, they can push through almost anything. And with the clefts, if there's any chance any water is going to get down in here like with this, then you want to make sure that's well covered. Ideally, it's probably better to tape over that first and then seal it, which I actually usually do, but I just don't care enough right now. But you don't want water to get in there. That's the main thing. I don't think a little paint in there is really a big deal. It might be. I mean, maybe it, it can prevent the healing from happening or something. I'm just going to try to get a bunch of paint down in there, though. So I let these dry too, so that if I bump into them, I don't get paint all over my clothes because it's so easy to get this stuff everywhere. My friend once was like, why do you have mustard all over your jacket? I'm like, oh yeah, that's grafting paint. Devonshire Crimson Queen. Now see, this is what I like to use for a scion. I would leave this whole. I might just cut it back here to get rid of that dead end trim that short and just graft the whole thing. And then it's gonna have at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight buds on there. That's what I wanna see. Keep these guys covered with a wet towel and in the shade over here. That's a good enough fit. Okay, we're almost done here. I'm just putting on the last tag and what I'll do with this, if I just put the tag on like that, it could easily blow off in the wind. So I'm gonna put it around, just make a simple twist like that and then put it around this branch again and twist that up tight. That way it won't blow off and later after it grows for a year or two, I can uh, easily you know, untwist it and put the tag up here somewhere. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and take off all of these spurs and blooms, just because that's really gonna tell the tree, you know, you got no choice but to fill out the, all the stuff I just put on there or grow new shoots. Now it is nice to retain some of this fruiting wood on these stems as long as possible in the young life of the tree, but eventually it dies out anyway. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 19, 20, 21 varieties on that little tiny tree and that's not crowded like each secondary scaffold or lateral whatever you want to call it is a different variety there's none are doubled up and none of those should be too crowded to grow and fruit well i managed to um, forget the label on one and in spite of my best efforts i could not figure out what it is i couldn't find like an old tag that was on it or anything that's just that okay there's one step left and it's important so you see this right here right at the graft that's borer activity so all this is dead if we go you know deep enough we can get into the live wood there this is old so that borer the actual bug is probably gone. It's good to get in here and just trim this out until you have green bark all the way around. See like right here. What you can do is if you find any holes and you think there might be one hiding up in the hole because they'll burrow in like this, get a guitar string or other thin wire. Guitar strings are great because they're springy and hard and they don't just bend. And then just stuff it up in the hole and wiggle it around and keep stabbing it in there and hope you, you know, stab it to death, which actually usually works. And if it's bad enough, it'll kill the whole tree if it goes all the way around the tree. In that case, it's just a small patch still. We don't want that, right? Those things like sunburned wood, and that is probably sunburned wood because it's on the west side of the tree, and you know where the sun when the sun comes down low in the afternoon and it's like at that little hump where the graft union is and it probably got sunburned and then the borers moved in what's going to happen is now that we've denuded this entire thing of wood and look how i chose places to graft that go off the sides see not off the top so the, all this is exposed to the sun now this will almost 100 percent guaranteed this is going to sunburn if i don't do something about it and then the borers are going to move in and they're going to finish off any bark that's not already dead and make a big old mess of this. The solution is to paint it. People put the sunscreen on their nose. It's basically like paint to block the sun. Well, we're going to do that. And especially with these branches, look at the angle of this. Like this is facing west. This is facing south. This is facing south. So it's just going to catch, you know, the rays of the sun directly and sunburn really easily now that there's no leaf cover. And you can use like 50-50 um, latex paint. I actually have a paint that I think is a borer deterrent um, and a sunburn protection. And it's 100% natural. If anything, it will feed the soil, you know, let alone not kill anything. And I'm not ready to release that yet in case I decide to turn it into like a a small scale business or hand it off to someone else to do that um, as a cottage industry, someone that's better at that sort of thing than me. So I may mix that up today and just for further testing of that. And otherwise I'll just mix like a 50-50, you know, zero, I have some zero VOC paint, so it doesn't have any volatile organic chemicals in it. Just mix that with 50% water and whitewash the, the surface there. There's a lot of tags on this tree because originally it was a cider tree, a Somerset Red Streak, and then I decided I wasn't that interested in cider. So with this tree, you know, this is Somerset Red Streak, the main stem, and then right here I grafted on Rubinet. And so each one of these branches was grafted to Rubinet and the top was grafted to Rubinet. So then I have the Rubinet tag and now I have all these other tags because there's no Rubinet left. I'm going to do this because this is so easy to put off. It's so easy to say, oh, well, the priority is to get more grafting done, right? Got to get more grafting done. I don't have that much time to do it. And I'll do this later, right? I'll paint the tree later and then you don't do it. And that's what happened with Chuck's tree in the videos we did on making Chuck's Franken tree. It's exactly what happened. And we never painted it and then it got sunburned and really messed up. You know, it's almost 100% that this is going to get sunburned if I don't do this. And there's, you know, not just the fact that trees sunburn easily, but if this thing is used to um, having that shade, right? I mean, it's used to having branches, it's used to having shade, and suddenly we take that away. It's like you at the end of the winter, and then you decide to take your shirt off and you're like, oh, let's take it off for 15 minutes. And then 20 minutes later, you have a sunburn. You want the stem to be exposed to sun gradually because just like us, it has protective mechanisms that it puts in place as it's exposed. This is a proprietary formula that I came up with for tree paint. And I've been sitting on it for a long time. I started experimenting with it about six years ago and I really haven't followed up, which is too bad because I've had abundant chances 
to test it. Really good situations like putting in all the seedling trees and stuff like that. But I'm always just running on, you know, on empty and barely getting stuff done and juggling priorities. I just dropped the ball. I should have this stuff pretty thoroughly tested and ready for market by now. This paint is intended to stop borers and prevent sunburn. Now I don't have to do, I'm gonna do this whole vertical trunk, but I don't have to do the undersides of the main limbs if I don't want to. Chances are borers will not lay eggs in there. I mean, they usually don't unless it becomes damaged. But I want, I really want all these top surfaces like this one right here. Real important to get those. You know, I would prefer to be able to just release this for anyone to use because I think it's going to work and I think it's going to be really good. But on the other hand, if anyone ends up making money off it, I'd rather it would be me or, you know, someone I know that I hand it off to or both. What might be really cool, I don't know the legality of this or how you would organize it, but have a license, uh, you know, basically a free license that anyone can use the recipe and just provide the recipe for free on the website. Just say, well, you know, you can use it, you can use it for your commercial orchard or your business or whatever, but you just can't make it and sell it. If you're gonna make money off producing the product and selling it, uh, don't. And that's just the way that I would make something off of it. I think that's a pretty great idea because I'd love for all you guys to be able to just, you know, make the stuff and use it. It's still in the testing phase right now. If we did it right, we could probably test it in five years pretty well. And then the materials in it have to be checked against the Organic Materials Research Institute standards, which could be really stupid. I mean, there's not definitely nothing in here that shouldn't be approvable, but you never know with a bureaucracy like that that for all we know is run by people who don't even farm. If I didn't do this, this would be like me, you know, making you take all your clothes off and run around in the sun all day long without any place to get out of the sun. You can't even move. You know, you can't even move and shift and roll over from one spot to another. That's what it's like for the tree. So they're tougher than we are, but again, almost 100% that this tree will suffer sunburn and then that borers will get into the, that sunburned bark and chew their way around and cause even more damage. It's very predictable. That's how you make a Franken tree. We have 21 varieties and we replaced all of the fruiting wood, but we've kept all of the good structural wood that we had. Now, one other issue you may have is that you don't have enough branches. Like some varieties, if you don't control how they sprout out, they won't sprout any, any of these branches to the side and they'll just grow way out, way out here and then they'll grow way out again and almost never produce any of these or very few of them. So there is one graph that you can do where you cut into the side of this and then you, you stuff the scion in sideways. And I don't need to do that, so I'm not going to show you, but I did show it in, it's the grafting lesson series video on frameworking and top working. The other thing I was going to say is that if you only have a few scions and you want to just add them to a big tree, let's say you have, you had this tree and you wanted to add, um, you know, five or six scions. Let's see this branch right here. I would suggest just doing that on one branch and, and leave the other branches growing how they are, you know, thin them if they need to, if there's any, anything shading this branch, but then prepare this whole branch and just graft the whole thing. And if not, it's okay also to leave a few, but what you want to do is you want to reduce competition in general. So now that this tree has no growing points left on it, I mean, it was, it was growing out pretty good, right? Like it was getting started, it was blooming. It has no growing points, so it's really going to push growing points. It's going to sprout some along these different places like that, and I'll have to come out and cut those out. But mostly it's going to heal these up, and then it's going to push these super hard, and especially if I take everything else off. So one of the ways you can force growth and make these grow bigger is just by the reduction of competition like that. So if you only have a few scions, I'd kind of recommend doing sections of the tree like that. And again, ideally, this is kind of a really great example right here. I have pretty long scions on most of these. You know, this one probably has eight or nine buds. This one probably has six or seven buds. This one probably has five or six buds. This one's a little shorter than I would like, but that's okay too. And you just use what you have and they're spaced really well. So I come out from the trunk quite a ways. That's like what, 14, 15 inches. I have a branch coming off here and then about 12 inches up, another branch going off here, 12 inches up, or well, 10 up there. This one will go out, and then I'll make another branch go that way, and maybe this one, and that'll be it. So that's a perfect setup right there. 
But if you have a situation like this, this is a perfect example where, you know, these two are close together and these two are close together, but that's just what the tree gives you. That's completely fine because this spacing is really good here. That's like, what, 16, 18 inches between those. And that's plenty of room for this to grow out and this to grow out and they won't conflict too horribly. Okay, good luck with your franken treeing. And if uh, you find my videos useful, share them anywhere that people might be able to use them. I need a bigger audience. If I don't get a bigger audience or more support on Patreon or uh, more use of my Amazon links, I'm gonna have to go find some other way to make money, which means spending my time doing something else instead of producing useful videos that anyone could watch anytime, 24 hours a day from anywhere in the world, which is what I want to do because I understand that there are a lot of people out there who have zero expendable income and increasingly everybody has internet access or more and more people have internet access. You know, I could spend my time writing books. I could spend my time making email courses or video courses and selling them instead of giving them away. You know, and I may, I may end up doing that or I may end up doing some of that. That just excludes a body of people who you know and i just think the new model the like the direction we're headed is not that direction you know that's going to become less and less relevant and we're going to have to find other ways uh, to fund our work i like to think of myself as basically an independent researcher and you know doing research and development for you know the benefit of whoever like my first priority is what can I do for you? And if I switch my mindset over to a marketing mindset and say, well, okay, like how am I going to leverage that knowledge and that information to get funds to fund my projects? And now I've gone from what can I do for you to what can I get from you? And these are entirely different mindsets and I'm literally struggling to <laughs> uh, recalibrate my brain in that direction because I just don't think that way and I never have. I'm working on it just to see if I can figure out some kind of balance, but I'm going to go under here pretty soon if I don't do better. So uh, thank you for watching and go get those Franken trees grafted because there should be a chicken in every yard and a Franken tree next to every garage. That's my campaign platform. <laughs>